Hello and welcome to today's broadcast on the Alton Gillingham approach. The reason Patos decided to review this approach is that 100 years ago, in 1923-24, the first publication of the Alton Gillingham approach was published. This year's Patos conference is reviewing what we have learned from the past to influence our future. It seems to us, in a time of rapid technological development in a more digital world where AI is increasingly becoming important, both in terms of teaching and learning and in the very near future assessment work, there are some principles that were discovered or, or at least scientific vigour was applied to them to confirm the importance of these strategies and approaches to teaching and learning. And then later on, the same principles applied to assessment work. So it seemed important to us to sort of celebrate these developments and to link it in to this year's conference. This is Samuel T. Alton. He named the approach that was the foundation of all approaches towards teaching students with dyslexia. He's a, he was a medically qualified doctor, he was a professor, and he worked at Columbia University. He got a grant and he went out and worked with and observed 125 children. And what he brought to the field was the vigour of the scientific medical observational approach to looking at students. He had studied the largest numbers of dead brains anywhere in the world. Obviously, those days you can look at a dead brain. He was fascinated in certain characteristics that he had observed. He was particularly fascinated in poor handwriting. Uh, his own handwriting is, was, was incredibly difficult to read. He was fascinated in spelling problems, particularly reversal of letters, um, which fitted into the visual work that had been proposed at an earlier period in time. He was also fascinated in the idea that dyslexia had a biological root, which he once again built upon the research of English and German physicians who sort of identified it mainly being a visual issue. He also recognised there could be co-occurring difficulties and was one of the first people to talk about co-occurring difficulties. And most importantly, unlike any other medical practitioner before his time, he proposed that the treatment was educational. As Samuel Alton realised that he needed to reach beyond his own professional base, he turned to two remarkable women. The first on the right, Annie Gillingham, and the second on the left, Bessie Stillman. Annie Gillingham was an educational psychologist who According to the recent book, Dyslexia History, that's been published by Philip Kirby and Margaret Snowling, was not allowed to do a PhD simply because of the fact she was a woman. Bessie Stillman was an educator, the teacher, who we believe was also dyslexic. So these two remarkable women took the research, the observations, the painstaking amount of observational case studies that Alton had written up and they turned it into a practical teaching approach. Samuel Alton's late wife, June Alton, said that without Anna Gillingham and Bessie Stillman, the approach would never have developed. They turned it into a manual that was first published in 1936. And that is why we still honour them by the title of Gillingham and Stillman approach, uh, as well as the Alton approach as well. It still is honoured today. This is an example of where women really led the development of an intervention in the early part of the 20th century. In the 21st century, we're still honouring the tradition they worked in. A Patos conference will try its utmost to bring the most up-to-date research from neurology, psychology, teaching and learning, and assessment work and try and present it in a way that is as applicable and ap applicable as possible for practitioners. And it still is honouring 
this tradition. Gillingham and Stillman took the research Autumn did and they put it into a manual. They took the idea of the fact that students with dyslexia, any students, need to be taught the language explicitly and that the most effective way of doing that is introducing phonics and explaining the link between a letter A and a sound it can also make A. And you carry this out in a highly multisensory way. And the purpose of multisensory learning is to try and engage all senses to encode the information you wish to encode. Um, for example, this is a visual card. It's got a, a letter D and it makes a sound D. You might have a picture on the other side. This is a dog. So there is a link between the sound and the picture, which can help the child recall the, the sound's name. So if the child gets stuck, you say, what's the picture? They say it, and hopefully that will enable them to say the sound. You might get the child in the air to trace the sound, and that's big movements, and these are called kinesthetic movements. You get them to say it, it's also kinesthetic. They can hear it auditory. You, you would then might even get them to trace on the card itself. They also introduce this idea that we introduce sound patterns and the language in what they would call a scope and sequence. So you introduce high frequency sounds. So high frequency sounds are the sounds which are most common in the English language. And what you do, you keep away sounds that my Come easily confused. So sounds like a and e are not introduced together. Then you also introduce other concepts like spelling rules, like uh, morphology, even at quite an early stage. You always make sure there's some kind of phonemic awareness task where the child hears and has to manipulate a sound, but not but only hear and manipulate it rather than write. And you do this in a way that makes the child feel confident and secure because you're going to have to repeat a large amount of concepts that you've already taught the child. You could spend 80% of the time of the lesson making sure that the child has securely learned what you have taught the child from the previous lesson. And this diagnostic and prescriptive approach could even start with, you might even want the child to start with a, uh, spellings or reading of what they previously did in the previous lesson. Uh, to make sure to check how much they can recall and learn. This approach is essential to identify and support the child. And, and Anna Gillingham came up with this concept that you go as fast as one can, but as slow as one must. And it's to help the child to make sure they're secure, overcoming the working memory difficulties, arresting the forgetting curve, so that they have actually learnt. You don't move on unless the child has learnt. But you do this in an emotionally sound way with games, with um, today often using bits of technology increasingly to encourage the child. And you make the child feel they've achieved success. So the child does most of the work rather than you talking to the child. So I've offered two examples of uh, teaching approaches in England. These aren't, I'm not favouring these approaches over any other. Alfred Omega was written by Bebby Hornsby, who was uh, someone who taught me uh, for a short period of time. Bevy Hornsby I was doing a master's degree in Bangor University and working with Professor Miles. Professor Miles was a famous Quaker. And there was a lady in America called Margaret Wilson, who worked in the same school for years and kept in contact with all her students and wrote a book about it. And Margaret Wilson uh, had Bevy Hornsby stay with her and she looked at the Alton Gillingham approach that Bevy Margaret was using. Margaret was trained by uh, Anna Gillingham and Bessie Stillman, so she was quite influenced by their work. Bevy developed Alpha to Omega based on what she observed. I think she probably introduced more, uh, she introduced quite a few changes to it, uh, I think because being a speech language therapist. Another good modern example of this would be the teaching literacy to learners with dyslexia and multisensory approach. 
but all the teaching approaches have at their core the same Alton Gillingham principles. At each conference, we try and interview people in the field of dyslexia. Last year's conference, we interviewed Angie Wilkins, who uh, was a previous president of the Alton Gillingham approach, uh, of the Alton Gillingham Academy. Uh, the Academy was set up to uh, maintain the tradition of Alton Gillingham. Her work around the world has been quite remarkable and her explanation to the Alton Gillingham approach is far better than mine because she has spent a lifetime teaching it. So if you wish to listen to this, you can by all means download this free of charge um, and develop a better understanding of the Alton Gillingham approach. And I think also to understand that the past does influence the future. And there are things that we were taught even 100 years ago uh, that are still as relevant today and they've ever been. One of our keynote addresses this year is from Professor Charles Buffetti, who is one of the leading experts in the world on the science of reading. His work has been fundamental in our understanding and development of how students learn to read, especially with dyslexia. He's also been the president of the uh, Reading Society uh, for many years. I've had the privilege of previously hearing him speak in the States and he is an extremely good speaker and extremely knowledgeable. And we do hope that when he identifies some of the gaps that he feels where research hasn't impacted in teaching and learning, that you'd be able to learn a lot from his keynote address. On the day itself, we also have Margaret Snowlin speaking about her recent book with Philip Kirby, looking at the history of dyslexia and in here she does mention the influence of Alton Gillingham. She also champions and explains that a lot of the impact was done by women and, and links it into the social changes that happened in England in the 60s and 70s and how that led to a re-evaluation of dyslexia and other, other learning differences. Um, We've listened to Maggie speak quite a few times. She's an outstandingly good speaker and we hope that it will be an interesting uh, second part of the day. As well as our two keynote speakers on the actual day of the conference, we enable you to download seminars prior to the conference or even after the conference, at least four weeks before and four weeks after. And I think we'll this range of expertise that we're offering at the conference is also in honour of the work of Gillingham, Stillman and Alton in the, in the multidisciplinary approach they developed. We have people from neurology, from maths, covering high functioning students with abilities, to looking at uh, how we spotlight the measurement on the actual uh, sentence and syntax and the impact that now has on writing. And also we've also introduced the most an extremely up-to-date seminar, as an additional seminar by Professor Anna Barnett and, Nick, and Dr. Nicholas Stewart on the use of the intelligent and developed scales, particularly looking at the executive functioning elements of that new test that assess that SPLD assessors can also uh, uh, buy and purchase. And at least three of these um, seminars will be SAS approved. So you can also pick up additional hours if you're an, uh, an assessor to make sure you, you complete your training. If you're interested in learning a practical version of the Alton Gillingham approach as developed by Mary Moran in Ireland, you can listen and watch her free webinar, which you can access from our website and you can also join on the 31st of January her course where she will be introducing how she how she developed and introduced her teaching materials. If you're interested in watching a free demonstration of multi-sensory cumulative learning this has been exampled in the work of Valerie Hammond in her book Spelling Stories which is a free webinar you can download. I hope if you've spent the time listening and watching this broadcast that you understand that we are seeking always to honour 
the past because through understanding what our predecessors have done, we can hopefully empower us in moving forward from learning the best practice and applying it into the 21st century. We know the world is changing. Um, technology is changing us. We understand that. But it's also important we don't forget the core purpose of what we're about in terms of supporting students, supporting youngsters and taking the best from the past and merging it with the best that the future has to offer.